British? Are you Welsh? Are you a bit of both? Since the Second World War, the pace of life here has been hotting up. And our sense of belonging has been shifting. The modern story of Wales is all about these two flags. The Red Dragon and the Union Jack, fighting for prominence. But the positions are changing, and that makes the final chapter of our story much more exciting. In this series, we've traced the story of life in Wales across 30,000 years. We followed humanity's journey from cave dweller to modern citizen. Since the dawn of history, people have been fascinated by the passage of time itself. But in the last 70 years, Wales has changed more rapidly than ever before. In this final part of our series, we'll see Wales fight for a British victory, a Welshman battles to set up Britain's most cherished institution, the British Parliament votes to drown a Welsh valley, sparking a debate about democracy and language. A new generation of sporting heroes sets the flags waving. And television itself becomes part of the story of Wales. As our nationalised industries decline, our sense of nationhood changes. We become a society of commuters and consumers, much like the rest of Britain. But our sense of identity and of our own history revives and strengthens. Wales and Britain, nation and state, will hear that it's not quite as simple as a race. This story of Wales has all the tension and drama of a dance. The Second World War. Wales suffers and fights shoulder to shoulder with the rest of Britain under the leadership of Winston Churchill and, of course, under the Union flag. And the war comes to Wales. German bombs set Pembroke Dock ablaze for three weeks. And there are devastating raids on our major towns and cities. For three terrifying nights in February of 1941, the port of Swansea is hammered by German bombers. The firestorm can be seen in the sky for miles around. It's clear that when the fighting is over, this town will have to be rebuilt. Lives will have to be rebuilt. There are thousands of Welsh people in the armed forces. Their lives will never be the same again. In every Welsh town, you'll find a memorial, like this one in Tredega, to those who make the ultimate sacrifice. The whole of Britain united against fascism. It seems obvious now, but it isn't something the authorities in 1939 take for granted. They take deliberate steps to bolster patriotism, as an expert in the period, Dr. Sean Nicholas, reminds me. Sean, I'm interested in this concept of Britishness? I mean, the idea of Britishness is obviously fundamental to the whole idea of getting everybody together for the war effort, um, the idea of it being a people's war. And so on the radio, for instance, accents become very important. You want the, a Welsh accent, you want a Scottish accent, you want a rural accent to balance an urban accent. In the BBC, in the Ministry of Information even, do not use English where you mean British. 
I mean, it's, you see the memos. Do not use English where you mean British. It really upsets the people in the other constituent nations of Great Britain. I don't think they get it perfect. A famous example is J.B. Priestley in his Dunkirk postscript, um, where he's talking about how, what an English epic it is and says, when I say English, I really mean British. But that's a problem through the whole war, is a lot of people in England, when they say English, they really meant British. They still do today. They still do today. It's something relatively new, the idea that you do recognise every part of the country within the idea of being British. This is the BBC. Home the BBC, and the British the Broadcasting Corporation, has stopped its regional the services during the war. Here is the news to German but its single, unified, UK-wide station is careful to reach out to Wales, and not just in English-language programmes. What actually you find is from February 1940, at five o'clock every night on the home service, um, you have the news in Welsh, and that goes right through the war. For everyone? Um, for everybody. Welsh, which would have been compartmentalised on the Welsh region, you know, becomes a national language for the duration of the war. I wonder what they made of that in, I don't know, um, Scunthorpe or Hull or even, you know, Essex or somewhere like that. I can't imagine. And on Tuesdays, after the news in Welsh, you had 20 minutes of Hour Plant, Children's Hour. When victory comes, Wales, like the rest of Britain, rejoices and waves the flag. And there's no doubt about which flag it is. Our returning troops are determined to make a new world, a new society. And no wonder. In 1945, the people who live in places like Tredegar have to put up with some rather basic conditions. They don't have any inside toilet, no central heating, certainly no televisions or telephones. What's needed is a new Wales. But any strategic decision to build that new Wales will have to be taken at a British level. Wales is fully plugged in to British institutions. We don't have many institutions of our own in any case, apart from the university or the Eisteddfod. We don't even have an officially recognised capital city. Wales is looking for British answers, and it's to Westminster that Welsh eyes turn in the 1945 election. Despite winning the war, Winston Churchill is thrown out of office. The voters want Clement Attlee, and the decisive reason is the Labour Party's promise to create the welfare state, which the Beveridge Report of 1942 had proposed. Labour wins because it talks about better housing, of support for the unemployed, of heavy industry owned by the people, and not driven by the kind of private profit that built this impressive building, Bedwelty House, in a way, it's a victory for old Welsh working-class traditions. The solidarity of the pit, the co-op and the choir. All of it linked to a big agenda for change. We have to be resolute about it and clear about it and say we can only safeguard employment for British workers by socialist planning in Great Britain and socialist planning in other parts of the world. Labour's leaders want change that embraces all of Britain. One of them is a Nairim Bevan. He was born into a mining family in Tredegar in 1897. He left school at the age of 13. He worked down the pit. At 21, he was running a club that provided medical care for the local community based on contributions made by the miners themselves. This isn't an orthodox government, and I'm not an orthodox minister of health. <laughs> Unorthodox he certainly is. As Minister for Health in the 1945 Labour Cabinet, he's getting the chance to put into action on a much grander scale what he'd been doing in Tredegar during the 1920s. Bevan is going to Tredegarise the rest of Britain. the new National Health Service starts. Providing Bevan is a firebrand, though for some his tongue is a little too sharp. Uh, if, you, if you're as quick on the job as you are on the questions, you're pretty good. 
Maybe it's because he's a Welshman. But he's much more than a rabble rouser. You don't force through the most far-reaching change in healthcare in the teeth of fierce opposition from senior doctors unless you're on top of your brief and you're a specialist at the negotiating table. How could anyone deny Anirim Bevan's place among the political greats of the 20th century for the scale of his ambition and his monumental determination? The scheme he devises, the National Health Service, enriches the life of just about every family in the country. It is still cherished and fought over today. It's a great example of an idea pioneered here in Wales, which benefits the rest of Britain. Like many other parts of Britain, work in Wales is still dominated by the old heavy industries. Attlee's government nationalises the mines and the post-war boom gives fresh impetus to coal and steel. In the late 40s, the Steel Company of Wales begins to drain lakes and marshland near the beach in Aberavon. They shift the sand dunes and raise the level of the whole site by three metres. And all to build the most modern steelworks in the world. Down the road, the Baglan Bay Petrochemical Complex and the Llandarcy Oil Refinery. This is about to become a modern industrial boom town. It doesn't look like Treasure Island, does it? Certainly not in this weather, but that's what they call this place. This is the massive Sandfields estate in Port Talbot, built to house thousands of workers and their families. Because Port Talbot, after the war, is all about heavy industry. Good money to be earned, and the housing conditions are far better than in the valleys where most of these people come from. So yes, in many ways, it is Treasure Island. There is a flip side to how rapidly our world is changing these days. It's how different even the most recent past must have been. Today's world moves at a pace that our grandparents would find dizzying. And they're excited by tastes that seem, well, rather vanilla to us. This is a very Welsh experience, isn't it? For me, at any rate. Coming to the seaside without the sunshine. The annual Sunday school trip comes to mind. I think it's fair to say that people in Wales in the 1950s and early 60s have a rather limited notion of leisure. But as living standards start to rise, so do people's expectations. And they start to look beyond the horizon for more exciting possibilities. All the conveniences that American housewives are enjoying are becoming available to Welsh women. The woman who proudly owns a new Hoover's... And we're even making these labour-saving white goods here in Wales, as Hoover's factory at Merthyr Tydfil keeps on growing. Welsh women have never had it so good. But the vacuum cleaner is not the only noise to reach Wales from across the Atlantic. It's easy to forget how shocking the first blast of rock and roll is for Welsh ears, more attuned to hymns and arias. But actually, industrialised Wales has been fully part of the modern world for three generations by now. By 1955, our newly designated official capital city is full of dance halls and cinemas and clubs with all kinds of modern sins, if that's what they are. They can easily cope with pop music, and enjoy it, and adapt it, and produce its own stars in the new modern idiom. Shirley Bassey emerges from a community which has always been ready to rock, Butte Town or Tiger Bay. It wasn't David's day 
When we got in Tiger Bay, Tiger Bay. Butown was a profoundly intercultural, multicultural community with a huge amount of tolerance. I knew a black woman in Butetown who could speak rather good Norwegian. She was not Norwegian, she was a cosmopolitan. I'll tell you a story. Um, Sheikh Zaid, um, um, who I knew rather well, who recently died, who was a, a local imam, um, I was talking to him once about a photograph that I'd seen of a Muslim procession that went on annually at Muhammad's birthday. And so I asked him, was this a traditional celebration that came from the Yemen? And he sort of laughed and he said, no. We saw the uh, Catholics at Corpus Christi um, had a nice sort of procession and we thought it was a pretty good idea. And so we decided to have our own. Butetown's special racial mix comes from its history as the world's busiest coal port, attracting sailors from all around the world. Crucial to this story is that Almost all the immigrants were male. Males who then married or had relationships with local women, um, many of whom might have been from the South Wales Valleys or from Cardiff. And so you get a community of males who are from, di from different countries, but of women who are local. Butetown poses questions about Welshness in a post-war nation which is still overwhelmingly white. I think that being Black and Welsh is less problematic in some ways than being black and English. Welsh identity includes a kind of notion of being anti-colonial, of being an oppressed people. You know, so when people say we were slaves, they say, and we were coal miners, you know, and, and, and kids went down the mines and, and it was awful and, and so on. And, and uh, you know, and even occasionally the, the joke that, you know, everybody's black under the ground and so on because of the coal dust. So there is a sense in Wales, quite a deep one, that we are an oppressed people who have some kind of identity with other oppressed people. That's different than, say, economic integration. So if you ask a question like about employment, job opportunities, and so on, it's different. And I think that very often, because people feel fairly comfortable, that it's very rare that someone insults you in the street, that people are mostly nice to you. Right? And so you can live in that place. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a land of opportunity. Butte Town is about to be redeveloped. The housing stock here and elsewhere desperately needs modernizing. All over the country, in Wrexham, Cadnarvon, the valleys, new council houses are going up and up and up. Change is coming even to Wales's most settled communities. In the heart of rural Wales in the 1950s, the traditional Welsh way of life is still strong. The people of these communities have grown up together. They know each other. They tend to be well-speaking. They tend to be loyal members of church and chapel. And they're bound together by those values of community and Christianity and well-speaking culture. And suddenly, all of that seems to be under threat. <laughs> Television is an alien intruder. TV can be awkward. It's the mountain sea. But extra transmitters are coming along. In homes where Welsh has always held sway, the English language is now advertising all the delights of modernity. Life here isn't all Bible black. It's very pleasant. Lots of nice village pubs around. Someone's got to be drinking in them. But the fact is, in rural Wales, in the 1950s, if you enter licensed premises, it does say something about you, and it is the kind of thing your neighbours are going to notice. Though there is one day of the week when they don't need to be on the lookout. That day is Sunday, when the doors of the chapels and churches are open, and the pubs are firmly shut. But now that tradition 
is put to a referendum. Eastern Wales votes for Sunday service of the alcoholic kind, dividing the country in two. That dividing line passes right here, across the Lacha Bridge. I'm not talking about the new bridge, I'm talking about the old bridge. You can see the approach to it here today. This is the dividing line between Glamorgan and Carmarthenshire. Still a very important dividing line today, believe me, between Swansea and Llanelli. In 1961, after the vote, this was the prime dividing line between two different versions of Wales. This side, Glamorganshire, wet. That side, Carmarthenshire, very dry. The symbolic importance of Sunday closing may be hard to appreciate now that we've all experienced 21st century licensing laws. But it shows how many people feel their traditional way of life has to be defended as we move into the swinging 60s. If you want a more graphic sense of the threat, come to this peaceful reservoir near Bala. In 1961, despite massive popular opposition, this dam wall is under construction and there's nothing that anyone in Wales can do to stop it. The bill to dam the Trewerin River to provide water for Liverpool has been up before Parliament. It means drowning the village of Capel Kellyn. When the vote is called, one of the 36 Welsh MPs abstains. The other 35 all vote against it. The bill is passed just the same. You know, it's one thing to contemplate the vast expanse of Llenkelin from the shore. But to take on the scale of events here, you need to come onto the lake itself. And to be immersed in the silence in the early morning like this, I have to say, is a profound experience. It's a silence that speaks of loss, the loss of a precious Welsh-speaking community in the heart of Wales. And yes, we can argue about the political waves that Trewerin produces, but there is an irony here too, because the village of Capel Kellyn, which lies submerged deep beneath these waters, plays a bigger part in our national life than it ever would have done had it been left in peace. Is it any surprise that this becomes the most famous piece of graffiti in the story of Wales? Cofiwch Trewerin. Remember Trewerin. Well, Trewerin is remembered because it kickstarts the two big engines of change in Welsh life for the rest of the 20th century. I'm talking about devolution and the language movement. A bit terribly in in a radio lecture in 1962, the writer and prominent nationalist Saunders Lewis predicts that the Welsh language will be dead by the end of the century. Revolutionary means are needed to save it. The lecture sparks the formation of the Welsh Language Society. Its protests capture the spirit of the time but divide English and Welsh speakers. To address the democratic deficit, the Council for Wales and Monmouthshire, an advisory body with no elected mandate, but the only national forum Wales has, recommends the creation of a Welsh office. When Labour wins the 1964 general election, the former collier and veteran MP for Llanelli, Jim Griffiths, becomes the first Secretary of State for Wales. But for nationalists, 
a Welsh office reporting to the British government is not enough. They want more, and they seem to have a following wind. The historian John Davis was an eyewitness to the election of Plaid Cymru's first MP. John, you were here. I was here, and it was a very remarkable night. I mean, for anybody who had been associated with, with politics in Wales, it, it was, I felt, a turning point. There were people crying. There were people yelling with delight. Wilbur Richard Evans, Ian Vilar Bumthick, can't sight the now. And then they came out to the windows there to announce, and there were rumours coming through. But nobody quite believed it. And when they heard that it was true, and that it was quite a decent majority, in fact, people were absolutely dazed. And people couldn't believe it, you know. I mean, the idea that Plaid Cymru could win a seat, it was generally lagging around 5 to 10%, even in the most promising seats. That it could jump to 38%, which is a huge jump, in electoral terms, seem to be many people impossible. This election has made history. So many people have declared through their vote that Wales is a nation and that they intend securing for this nation a full national future. The result also highlights a debate within the nationalist movement between supporters of civil disobedience and those like Winver Evans who back more conventional politics. He had been a, a very strong advocate of constitutional action. And in fact, people said, well, you know, the constitutional path isn't taking us anywhere. And that was the kind of tension you had in the early 60s. Now, when he won in, here in Carmarthen in 1966, it put paid to that sort of protest uh, to a very great extent. It's still the whole thing. The Gymnath has carried on with its own protests. But on the broader political front, uh, the notion that action through elections, through constitutional means, was the only path forward, uh, was one of the, I think, most important results of the election here in Carmarthen. So the Carmarthen by-election is a victory for those nationalists who believe that home rule can be secured through the ballot box. From now on, nationalism isn't just about protest, civil disobedience and revolution. The political landscape is changing. And for a while, it looks as if the nationalist pitch of Plaid Cymru will bring seats here, in the South Wales Valleys, not just in Welsh-speaking Wales. But it doesn't happen. That momentum stalls. And it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that here in Ebu Vale, for example, what motivates people isn't nationalism, it is nationalisation. Their big local industry is being taken into public ownership. There's a sense of confidence, a sense of pride. That industry is steel, British steel. The British Steel Corporation brings together the UK's 14 main steel producing companies. After years of underinvestment, steel workers can see a bright new future. And they're helping to forge that future themselves through the powerful Works Council. But if South Wales reckons it's got a grip on a thriving future in steel and coal, one terrible Friday morning reminds the valleys and the whole world of the price that heavy industry can exact. Pant Glass Junior School Memorial Garden dedicated to 116 children and 28 adults who lost their lives October the 21st, 1966. A massive heap of spoil from Merthyr Vale Colliery collapses onto the village of Abervan. Twenty houses and the Pant Glass Junior School are buried.
Despite the enormity of the disaster that day, the chair of the National Coal Board, Lord Robins, goes ahead with his plans to be installed as Chancellor of the University of Surrey. He doesn't arrive in Aberfan until the following evening. At first, Robins claims that the disaster has been caused by natural unknown springs beneath the tip. But the existence of these springs was common knowledge. Did you give an explanation of your interview when you said that no one could have known that the centre of the mountain was turning into slush because of a stream? Well, uh, I answered all the questions that were put to me and I hope that the answers did convey such explanations as were required by the tribunal. In the final stage of the disaster tribunal, Robins concedes that the NCB is at fault, an admission which would have made much of the 76-day inquiry unnecessary had it been made at the outset. But Robins doggedly refuses to fund the removal of the remaining tips from Aberfan. The work is eventually paid for by raiding the disaster relief fund that had been raised by a public appeal for the bereaved families. The tragedy of Aberfan is the tragedy of Wales' most terrible accident. But it is also a story of the distance between ordinary people in Wales and the bosses of a nationalised industry organised on a British basis. Wales and Britain, so intimately linked, but sometimes pulling in different directions. By the end of the decade, those underlying tensions come to a head right here at Carnarvon Castle. The occasion is the investiture of the Prince of Wales. It is one of the biggest royal pageants of the 20th century. And despite a vigorous campaign by some nationalists, and a failed bomb plot, the event goes ahead, watched worldwide by a television audience of many millions of people. But what is the dominant Welsh attitude to this event? An opinion poll published on the day itself suggests that three quarters of Welsh people are delighted with the choice of Charles as Prince of Wales. But how do we square that with poll after poll that suggests Welsh people want self-government as well? I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb. It is indeed my firm intention to associate myself in word and deed with as much of the life of the Principality as possible. And what a Principality! After all, he is joining a winning team Wales and rugby. Broadly speaking, in the 1970s, football is just as popular, female fans are in the minority, and North Wales hasn't even caught the bug yet, and yet it's rugby and Wales that seem to go together. To find out why, I've come to a British Legion club to meet an historian of modern Wales, Dr Martin Johns. Martin. Let's talk about emblems of Welshness. The biggest emblem of all for lots of people, rugby. Rugby is very important as an expression of Welshness because it was one of the few popular areas of life where Wales could say we are a nation, we are distinct from the rest of Britain. Rugby had helped keep alive a popular sense of Welshness and it had been able to do that because it didn't really involve any questions about what that Welshness actually meant. You didn't have to speak Welsh to follow the Welsh rugby team. You didn't, it didn't really matter what part of Wales you were from, what class you were from. Rugby brought Wales together without raising any awkward questions. Can he score? It would be a miracle if he could. He may well get there. And he has. No awkward questions, maybe, but some awkward moments. Wales played Japan. They play the Japanese national anthem, and then they start playing God Save the Queen. And really unexpectedly, the crowd start booing 
um, God Save the Queen and you can't hear the band according to the press reports. And from that moment on, the Welsh Rugby Union start to say, well, OK, when England are playing, or even Scotland, because that's the anthem they wanted, it's fair enough. But when other countries are playing Wales, should we be playing God Save the Queen at all? And in 1974, Wales dropped God Save the Queen for the visit of France, and that's a really symbolic moment. According to the Times, it's through rugby that the Welsh express their tribal loyalty and surface nationalism. But is it a symbol of anything deeper? Being Welsh really mattered to people in the 1970s, and rugby is a great expression of that. But it only mattered so far. Nobody imagined Wales could survive on its own economically. Most people didn't feel there was any tension between being Welsh and being British. Back in the 70s, clubs like this were full of men. Does the role of women change as the 70s progresses? The 1970s sees the number of working class women who are working rise hugely. Um, they might not have been getting paid the same as men, they might not have been working the same amount of hours, they were still relatively limited in the kind of jobs they could do, but they were working and that made a big economic difference to Wales. And they're also starting to question some of the bastions of life. Women before the 70s were often barred in, in clubs like this. In the 1970s, they are literally banging on the door asking to be let in. When they are being let in, they're asking to be served, even asking to be served in a pint glass. And there was a case in Newport where a woman made an official complaint to the government in London that she'd been refused a pint. And Newport is one of those places which is much better connected in the 1970s. The extension of the M4, like the later upgrading of the A55 in the north, eases the path from Wales to the centre of the British economy. But that economy is in trouble. The price of oil soars. British industry can't compete. In 1975, the Ebu Vale Steelworks partially closes. Nationalisation has turned into rationalisation. Between 1976 and 1979, 60,000 jobs are lost in Wales. Interest rates are 28%. The International Monetary Fund has to bail out the British economy. In the middle of all of this turmoil, the people of Wales experience one of the most explosive political campaigns of the 20th century. It affects these rural Welsh-speaking parts just as much as it does the industrialised English-speaking ones. On St David's Day, 1979, the Welsh people take part in a referendum. The Labour government is offering them a Welsh assembly in Cardiff, and by a crushing majority of four to one, they say no thanks. And the impact of that result is still being debated today. Some people see it as one of the most shameful and demeaning episodes in Welsh history. There is another perspective. Given the economic mess of the time, it can be seen as a simple expression of priorities. People were more concerned about jobs and livelihoods than about anything else. Labour is in disarray and Margaret Thatcher sweeps to power in 1979 with a mandate to sort out Britain's problems. But when the Conservatives go back on a promise to set up a Welsh language television channel, nationalists make a stand. For Gwynvor Evans, it might be his last stand. He threatens to fast to death, but he wins the argument. The government has been humiliated, the government has been defeated, and that by uh, a commercially small people. The Tories are for turning, after all, and S. Pedwarek hits the airwaves. British living standards start to rise again in the 1980s. Wales becomes a summer playground for those who can afford to splash the cash. It's not difficult to see why the hard workers of Manchester and Merseyside invest so much of their leisure time and their money here on the North Wales coast. But they're just a small fraction of the great influx of people who come in from England to Wales over the years. They come here to live and to retire and to work, of course. 
But in the 1980s, that trend increases. There's more disposable income. They start to buy property, permanent homes and holiday homes. And they buy them, not just in areas like Llandidno, but further inland, in the heart of Welsh-speaking Wales, often outbidding some of the locals in the process. And some of the people who care for the language are now concerned that a television channel won't be enough. Violence is back in the news. Across the decade, there are more than 200 attacks on holiday homes in Welsh-speaking areas. Though there are some arrests, the identity of those behind maybe on Glyndwr, the sons of Glyndwr, remains a mystery. The tacit support they seem to have in some communities is seen as a sign that the Conservative government isn't doing enough to protect the language. Nineteen eighty. Government owned British Steel makes six and a half thousand shotten steel workers redundant. For North East Wales, it is a body blow. But it's worth reminding ourselves that Wales does embrace Thatcherism to quite an extent. Things are changing. The old heavy industries are weakening. The emphasis on the individual is strengthening. And radical policies like allowing council house tenants to buy their homes are very popular. And after the 1979 election, it's possible for the Conservatives to say that you can travel from the fields of Monmouthshire at this end of Wales and without one sleeve in Conservative-held territory, you can walk all the way to Unismorn, the Isle of Anglesey, here in the north. At the next general election in 1983, Wales elects even more Conservative MPs to join Mrs Thatcher's crew. 14, a record number in modern times. And here's the significant part. Even those voters who are not backing Mrs Thatcher are still looking to Westminster for the answer to their political problems. It is still very much a British agenda. But that may be about to change. The year-long strike by the National Union of Miners is a watershed for industrial Wales. The solidarity of whole communities is put to the test. They pass with flying colours. But they do end up on the losing side. What I would say about that strike is that it wasn't about Wales at all. It was about a class struggle. It, it, it was about wage struggles. And yet, when it was ended, and when the NUM was defeated, there came a sense very slowly, I think, to people of this world that what they had been experiencing from the 1960s through the 1970s had, in fact, come to a dramatic end. That strike ended the particular kind of industrial male working class world that Wales had predominantly been about in the 20th century. And I think that Wales dematerialized. It, it, it sort of vanished. You could certainly taste a sense of despair in Wales at the end of the 80s and into the 1990s. The institutions that it had created to defend it, including, of course, the unions and the Labour Party, were powerless. So what were they now going to do? The choices for the industrial valleys are narrowing. Deep mining disappears. A rich history seems redundant. And the Welsh people had to find a new way of expressing their sense of society, their sense of grievances, and perhaps their sense of a national identity. That sense of nationhood isn't something that can be taken for granted. Look, Wales is an entity. It's a geographical entity. But it's a fragmented one. It always has been. Wales is united because of the language, but it's also divided because of the language. Wales comes together because of its history, but there are many histories of Wales and many different ways of expressing that identity. So how did we find a new form of unity? We certainly decided as a people to invest in those civic institutions that would give us a sense of citizenship. We become citizens of Wales as never before. But a citizen's Wales can't shield its industrial communities from the effects of losing so many jobs. Young people suffer most of all.
poverty and unemployment leave scars on a whole generation. Drug and alcohol abuse soar. And the government's determination to restructure the labour market becomes a divisive issue. But there is a plan. Butte Town is about to be redeveloped all over again. The Cardiff Bay Barrage is meant to regenerate business life and not just in the capital. Big projects and inward investment, pulling in manufacturers from abroad, are intended to get the whole economy moving. And the momentum towards a citizen's Wales gathers pace. When we think of national institutions in Wales, we think of places like this. The University of Wales here in Aberystwyth, or if you like, the National Eisteddfod, or the National Museum, they're the obvious ones. But in the middle of the 1980s, someone decides to draw up a list of these national bodies. And they come up with 466 of them. It's a kind of devolution process by committee. As the Welsh office creates more and more quangos, you have unions and charities and other bodies all wanting to have a presence in Wales. And the fact is, under the Conservative and Unionist Party, Wales is quietly organising itself in ways that are notably different to the rest of the United Kingdom. And you can't move anywhere in Wales without spotting that. There was a time when our road signs had no Welsh on them. And I remember the shock of seeing a bilingual road sign for the first time. Can I be honest? I was very pleased. But under the Conservatives, in the 1980s, with Margaret Thatcher in charge, funding for the language multiplies. And that trend continues under John Major's government, with a Welsh Language Act cementing the place of the language in society and in schools as well. No one can be in any doubt that Wales is a nation of two languages, even if one of those languages is missing the letter X. Even if you can please do come out. In communities which turned to English two generations before, Welsh medium schools are now full to bursting. Migration from England to coast and countryside is still on the up, but industrial Wales is rediscovering its Welshness. The language has ceased to be such a divisive issue. People who say they're Welsh rather than British? Well, most of them are now to be found in the former coalfield. But does this mean a majority is ready for devolution? For the second time in 18 years, the Welsh are being offered a modest measure of self-government, but will they take it? Meal? 26,000. So I think now. that's a yes all round. Well, look at that. They're incredibly emotional pictures, really. People crying and dancing and laughing. To go from depression to elation in a matter of moments is an incredible feeling. Good morning. And it is a very good morning in Wales. Yeah. The shift from 1979, when the Welsh people voted 4 to 1 against uh, a Welsh Assembly, to 1997, where there was that wafer thin 6,721 votes difference between the yes and no votes, is, is really substantial by any stretch of the imagination. The objective was to get a majority, and we've got a majority. Yeah. The biggest changes happened in those areas which were traditional labour supporting areas. So if you look across the South Wales Valleys, areas like Neath, Port Talbot, all the way really across that, that mining or former mining belt. But the slim majority becomes an issue for the new assembly. It wasn't a great foundation for the new politicians when they took office. They were up against it from the word go, justifying their existence, the existence of the institution, the location of the National Assembly. Every country anywhere in the world has some resentment expressed towards its capital by those areas most remote. The Assembly struggles to make an impact across the country. 
In its first decade, it has no more success in lifting Wales out of poverty than the British government has achieved over the centuries. Much of Wales still receives funding intended for Europe's poorest regions. Educational performance is weak, health and social problems trouble us. But the Assembly does have its successes, working effectively when farms are affected by foot and mouth disease in 2001. And the principle that Welsh issues should be tackled here in Wales begins to gain wider acceptance. All of the opinion polling, all of the shift in national identity indicators show that the Welsh people are very pragmatic. They recognise that it is appropriate and right for decisions about Wales to be made at a Welsh level. But then on the other hand, I think, they're very clear that there is still real integrity within the Union of the United Kingdom and they want to be part of that Britishness as well. As our traditional industries have disappeared, we've become a nation of commuters like so many others. Wales is much more diverse these days, home to people from many parts of the world. Multiculturalism no longer starts and ends in Butte Town. And yet, miraculously, in a globalised world, Wales has kept a sense of itself. A referendum in 2011, albeit with a low turnout, backs lawmaking powers for the Assembly. Wales has said yes. Today, an old nation came of age. Support for Wales these days seems genuinely deeper than surface nationalism. We are a people with roots, with a real sense of where we come from. Good evening. Hundreds of school children marched through Tonopandi, remembering the miners' riots a hundred years ago. This is living history. This is history in the making. History matters to us. It's what has shaped the spaces we live in. That's why it's so important to have these beautiful buildings like the Senedd and the Wales Millennium Centre because they give us frameworks in which to dream of futures, to be critical of ourselves, but also to project outwards. Gwyneth Lewis is the poet whose words sing out from the Millennium Centre. One of the big payoffs of devolution has been the way in which the definition of Welshness has expanded, grown more complex, um, has become more hospitable, I think, um, in a way that I think is very creative. It's given us a freedom to play with our sense of identity and it's broadened the base of people who are excited about being in Wales, about living in Wales and getting some serious work done here. Gwyneth Lewis believes that this excitement is beginning to change our sense of belonging. The two terms, Welshness and Britishness, have been dancing a tango for a long time. And there are periods when we're dancing very close, cheek to cheek. Other times we're pulling apart, we're angry with each other. There's tension. And that's actually what creates the dance. These are, are not small um, shifts in our sense of ourselves. The time since the beginning of devolution has been quite painful one. We've been looking at the new assembly, learning to crawl, walk, stumble, and there have been failures, and these have been painful to watch. Welshness and Britishness. I think it's actually a dynamic relationship. The more that we're able to tolerate that change and that development, the more it changes into something very creative for citizens. We're freed from worrying about things, we're just enjoying the dance. We're at the stage now that the story is to be continued, um, but I think we're developing a far more sophisticated view of what it is to be Welsh and what's required to make the best of those uh, resources that we do have um, 
So I'd be very, very interested to see what happens next. In this series, I've tried to step back from the turmoil and the immediacy of today's news to tell the story of an entire country over the course of 30,000 years. The story of Wales, like the story of any nation, has seen dark days and troubled times. But it has never been a story of people turned in on themselves. You're saying we should think of Wales in a much bigger world. And all through its history, there have been times when it has led the way. Llandidno copper was being exported 4,000 years ago. In the Dark Ages, Welsh saints carried the light of Christianity to Scotland and Ireland, Cornwall, Brittany and Spain. Welsh laws, based on putting things right rather than an eye for an eye, were the most progressive of the Middle Ages. In the 1700s, the Welsh became one of the most literate nations on earth. Half the population of Wales learns to read in these travelling schools. And in a modern world which Wales helped to power, we've been leaders in technology, in education, in the struggle for workers' rights and decent health care. Are we Welsh? Are we British? In the last 70 years, the balance has shifted. We've always been a people who love our square mile, our own little bit of Wales. But now we also have a national frame in which to address our problems, a politics and a set of institutions all of our own. And above all, we are a people with a story. And that story gives us power. The story of Wales is being rewritten, not before time. It's the story of a people who embrace the big world, beyond that horizon, not insular and inward-looking, but imaginative and dynamic and creative. We're an ancient people more certain of our identity than at any point in the past thousand years. And in that sense, the story of Wales has only just begun. The Open University has produced a free booklet for you to learn more about the history of the people of Wales. You can call 0845 366 0253 or go to bbc.co.uk slash story of Wales and follow the links to the Open University. Dan Snow explores the empire of the seas here on BBC HD at 7 tomorrow night. And coming up next this evening, we're off to the wartime farm. <laughs>